volume one chapter five of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five poor little life that toddles half an hour crowned with a flower or two and there an end sir godfrey's device for diverting his wife's mind from the morbid fancies of the previous night answered admirably she left dorchester in high spirits after having invited her cousins to cheriton for tennis and lunch on the following day and after having bade an affectionate good-bye to theodore who was to start on his holiday directly he could make an end of some important business now in hand his father told him laughingly that he might have gone a week earlier had he really wanted to go i believe there must be some attraction for you in dorchester though i am not clever enough to find out what it is said mr dalbrook innocently for you have been talking about going away for the last fortnight and yet you don't go lady carmichael had lingered in the homely old house till afternoon tea had lingered over her tea telling her cousins all they wanted to know about smart society in london that one central spot of bright white light in the dull grey mass of a busy commonplace world of which she knew so much and of which they knew so little janet and sophia professed to be above caring for these things except from a purely philosophical point of view as they cared for ants bees and wasps but they listened eagerly all the same with occasional expressions of wonder that human beings could be so trivial five hundred pounds spent in flowers at lady drumlock's ball cried sophie and to think that in a few more million years the sun may be as cold as the north pole and what trace will there be then of all this butterfly world did the mountains cut a tremendous dash this season asked janet frivolously curious about their immediate neighbours county people who went to london for the season of course you know she had thirty thousand pounds left her by an uncle quite lately and she is so utterly without brains that i dare say she will spend it all in entertainments oh they did entertain a good deal and they did their best poor things and people went to them juanita answered with a deprecating air but still i should hardly like to say that they are in society in the first place she has never succeeded in getting the prince at any of her dances and in the next place her parties have a cloud of provincial dullness about them against which it is in vain to struggle he can never forget his constituents and his duty to his borough and that kind of thing does not answer if one wants to give really nice parties i'm afraid her legacy won't do her much good poor soul unless she gets some clever person to show her how to spend it there is a kind of society instinct don't you know and she is without it i believe the people who give good parties are born not made like poets and orators sir godfrey looked down at her smiling at her juvenile arrogance which to his mind was more bewitching than another woman's humility we mean to show them the way next year if we take a house in town he said but we are not going to have a house in town answered juanita quickly why godfrey you know i have done with all that kind of frivolity we can go to victoria street in may and stay with our people there long enough to see all the pictures and hear some good music and just rub shoulders with the friends we like at half a dozen parties and then we will go back to our nest at the priory do you think that i am like lady mountain and want to waste my life upon the society struggle when i have you it was after five o'clock when they left dorchester it was more than half-past seven when they drew near cheriton and the sun was setting behind the irregular line of hills towards studland they approached the manor by one of the most picturesque lanes in the district a lane sunk between high banks rugged and rocky and with here and there a massive trunk of beech or oak jutting out above the roadway while the gnarled and twisted roots spread over the rough shelving ground and seemed to hold up the meadowland upon the higher level a dark secret-looking lane it must have seemed on a moonless night sunk so deeply between those earth walls and overshadowed by those gigantic trunks and interlacing branches but in this mellow evening light it was a place in which to linger there was a right of way through cheriton chase and this sunk lane was the favoured approach a broad carriage drive crossed the chase and park skirted the great elm avenue that led to the house and swept round by a wide semicircle to the great iron gates which opened on the high road from wareham the steep gable ends of an old english cottage rose amidst the trees on the upper ground just outside the gate at the end of the lane it was a veritable old english cottage and had been standing at that corner of the park like meadow for more than two hundred years and had known but little change during those two centuries it was a good deal larger than the generality of lodges and it differed from other lodges in so much as it stood outside the gate instead of inside and on a higher level than the road 
but it was a lodge all the same and the duty of the person who lived in it was to open the gate of cheriton chase to all comers provided they came in such vehicles as were privileged to enjoy the right of way there was a line drawn somewhere perhaps at coal wagons or tradesmen's carts but for the generality of vehicles the carriage road across cheriton chase was free a rosy-faced girl of about fourteen came tripping down the steps built into the bank as the carriage approached and was curtsying at the open gate in time for sir godfrey to drive through without slackening the pace he gave her a friendly nod as he passed does mrs porter never condescend to open the gate herself he asked juanita seldom for any one except my father i think she makes a point of doing it for him though i believe he would much rather she didn't you mustn't sneer at her godfrey she is a very unassuming person and very grateful for her comfortable position here though she has known better days poor soul that is always such a vague expression what were the better days like she is the widow of a captain in the mercantile marine i think it is called a man who was almost a gentleman she was left very poor and my father who knew her husband gave her the lodge to take care of and a tiny pension not so much as i spend upon gloves and shoes i'm afraid and she has lived here contentedly and gratefully for the last ten years it must be a sadly dull life for she is an intellectual woman too refined to associate with upper servants and village tradespeople so she has no one to talk to literally no one except when the vicar or any of us call upon her but that is not the worst poor thing pursued juanita dropping her voice to a subdued and sorrowful tone she had a great trouble some years ago you remember don't you godfrey i blush to say that mrs porter's trouble has escaped my memory oh you have been so much away you would hardly hear anything about it perhaps she had an only daughter her only child a very handsome girl whom she had educated most carefully and the girl went wrong and disappeared i never heard the circumstances i was not supposed to know but i know she vanished suddenly and that there was a good deal of fuss with mother and the servants and the vicar and mrs porter's hair began to whiten from that time and people who had not cared much for her before were so sorry that they grew quite fond of her it is a common story enough said godfrey what could a handsome girl do except go wrong in such a life as that did she open the gate while she was here only for my father i believe mrs porter has always contrived to keep a girl in a pinafore like that girl you just saw now all the girls come from the same family or have done for the last six or seven years as soon as the girl grows out of pinafores she goes off to some better service and a younger sister drops into her place and her pinafores i suppose mrs porter's girls always do well she has a reputation for making a good servant out of the raw material a clever woman no doubt very clever to have secured a lodge-keeper's berth without being obliged to open the gate a woman who knows how to take care of herself you ought not to disparage her godfrey the poor thing has known so much trouble think of what it was to lose the daughter she loved and in such a way worse than death i don't know about that death means the end a loving mother might rather keep the sinner than lose the saint and the sinner may wash herself clean and become a saint after the order of mary magdalen if this mrs porter had been really devoted to her daughter she would have followed her and brought her back to the fold she would not be here leading a life of genteel idleness in that picturesque old cottage while the lost sheep is still astray in the wilderness you are very hard upon her godfrey i am hard upon all shams and pretences i have not spoken to mrs porter above half a dozen times in my life she never opens the gate for me you know but i have a fixed impression that she is a hypocrite a harmless hypocrite perhaps one of those women whose chief object in life is to stand well with the vicar of her parish they were all at the door by this time and it was a quarter to eight let us sit in the drawing-room this evening godfrey said juanita as she ran off to dress for dinner the library would give me the horrors after last night my capricious one you will be tired of the drawing-room to-morrow i should not be surprised if you ordered me to sit on the housetop we might rig up a tent for afternoon tea between two chimney-stacks juanita made a rapid toilette and appeared in one of her graceful cream white tea-gowns veiled in a cloud of softest lace just as the clocks were striking eight she was all gaiety to-night just as she had been all morbid apprehension last night and when they went to the drawing-room after dinner together for it was not to be supposed that sir godfrey would linger over a solitary glass of claret 
she flew to the grand piano and began to play tito mattei's famous waltz which seemed the most consummate expression of joyousness possible to her the brilliant music filled the atmosphere with gaiety while the face of the player turned to her husband as she played harmonized with a light-hearted melody the drawing-room was as frivolously pretty as the library was soberly grand it was lady cheriton's taste which had ruled here and the room was a kind of record of her ladyship's travels she had bought pretty things or curious things whenever they took her fancy and had brought them home to her cheriton drawing-room thus the walls were hung with algerian embroideries on damask or satin and decorated with rhodian pottery the furniture was a mixture of old french and old italian the dresden tea services and ivory statuettes and capo di monte vases and copenhagen figures had been picked up all over the continent without any regard to their combined effect but there were so many things that the ultimate result was delightful the room being spacious enough to hold everything without the slightest appearance of overcrowding the piano stood in a central position and was draped with a japanese robe of state a mass of rainbow-hued embroidery on the ground of violet satin almost covered with gold thread it was the most gorgeous fabric godfrey carmichael had ever seen and it made the piano a spot of vivid party-coloured light amidst the more subdued colouring of the room the silvery silken curtains the delicate indian muslin draperies and the dull tawny plush coverings of sofas and chairs the room was lighted only by clusters of wax candles and a reading-lamp on a small table near one of the windows it was a rule that wherever sir godfrey spent his evening there must always be a reading-table and lamp ready for him he showed no eagerness for his books yet awhile but seemed completely happy lolling at full length on a sofa near the piano listening and watching as juanita played she played more of mattei's brilliant music another waltz an arrangement of non Evert, and then dashed into one of chopin's wildest mazurkas with an audacious self-abandonment that was almost genius godfrey listened rapturously delighted with the music for its own sake but even more delighted for the gladness which it expressed she stopped at last breathless after mendelssohn's capriccio godfrey had risen from the sofa and was standing by her side i'm afraid i must have tired you to death she said but i had a strange sort of feeling that i must go on playing that music was a safety valve for my high spirits my darling i am so glad to see that you have done with imaginary woes we may have real troubles of some kind to face by and by perhaps as we go down the hill so it would be very foolish to abandon ourselves to fancied sorrows while we are on the top real troubles yes sickness anxiety the fear of parting said juanita in a troubled voice oh godfrey if we were to give half our fortune to the poor if we were to make some great sacrifice do you think god could spare us such pangs as these the fear the horrible fear of being parted from each other my dearest we cannot make a bargain with providence we can only do our duty and hope for the best at any rate let us be very very good to the poor urged juanita with intense earnestness let us have their prayers to plead for us the night was warm and still and the windows were all open to the terrace godfrey and juanita took their coffee in their favourite corner by the magnolia tree and sat there for a long time in the soft light of the stars talking the old sweet talk of their future life we must drive to swanet and see lady jane to-morrow said juanita by and by don't you think it was very wrong to go to see my people only cousins after all before we went to your mother she will come to us dear directly we give her permission i know she is dying to see you in your new character how lovely she looked at the wedding in her pale grey gown and bonnet i love her almost as well as i love my own dear good indulgent mother and i think she is the most perfect lady i ever met i don't think you'll find her very much like the typical mother-in-law at any rate replied godfrey gaily they decided on driving to swanage next morning they would go in the landau and bring the mother back with them for a day or two if she could be persuaded to come juanita stifled a yawn presently and seemed somewhat languid after her sleepless night and long day of talk and vivacity i am getting very stupid company she said i'll go to bed early to-night godfrey and leave you an hour's quiet with wider horizons i know you are longing to go on with that book but your chatterbox wife won't let you 
of course he protested that her society was worth more than all the books in the british museum he offered to take his book up to her room and read her to sleep if she liked but she would not have it so you shall have your own quiet corner and your books just as if you were still a bachelor she said caressingly as she hung upon his shoulder for a good-night kiss as for me i am utterly tired out janet and sophy talked me to death and then there was the long drive home i shall be as fresh as ever to-morrow morning and ready to be off to dear lady jane he went into the hall with her and to the top of the stairs for the privilege of carrying her candlestick and he only left her at the end of the corridor out of which her room opened she did not ring for her maid preferring solitude to that young person's attendance she did not want to be worried with elaborate hair-brushing or ceremonies of any kind she was thoroughly exhausted with the alterations of emotion of which her life had been made up of late and she fell asleep almost as soon as her head touched her pillow the bedroom was over the drawing-room her last look from the open casement had shown her the reflection of the lights below on the terrace she was near enough to have spoken out of the window to her husband had she been so minded she could picture him sitting at the table at the corner window in his thoughtful attitude his head bent over his book one knee drawn up nearly to his chin one arm hanging loosely across the arm of his low easy-chair she had watched him thus many a time completely absorbed in his book she slept as tranquilly as an infant and her dream wanderings were all in pleasant places with him always with him confused after the manner of all dreams but with no sign of trouble what was this dream about being with him at woolwich where they were firing a big gun a curious dream she had been there once with her father to see a gun drawn but she had never seen one fired there and now in her dream she stood in a crowd of strange faces fronting the river and there was a long grey iron-clad on the water a turret ship and there came a flash and then a puff of white smoke and the report of a gun short and sharp not like the roar of a cannon by any means and yet her dream showed her the dark sullen gun on the grey deck the biggest gun she had ever seen she started up from her pillow cold and trembling the report of the gun had seemed so real and so near that it had awakened her she was wide awake now and pushed back her loose hair from her eyes and felt under her pillow for her watch and looked at it in the dim light of the night lamp on the table by her bed a quarter to one she had left the drawing-room a few minutes after ten it was long for godfrey to have sat reading alone but he was insatiable when he had a new book that interested him she got up and put on her slippers and dressing-gown prepared to take him to task for his late hours she was not alarmed by her dream but the sound of that sharp report was still in her ears as she lighted her candle and went down into the silent house she opened the drawing-room door and looked across to the spot where she expected to see her husband sitting his chair was empty the lamp was burning just as she had left it hours ago burning with a steady light under the green porcelain shade but he was not there puzzled and with a touch of fear she went slowly across the room towards his chair he had strayed out onto the terrace perhaps he had gone out for a final smoke she would steal after him in her long white gown and frighten him if she could he ought at least to take me for a ghost she thought she stopped transfixed with a sudden horror he was lying on the carpet at her feet in a huddled heap just as he had rolled out of his chair his head was bent forward between his shoulders his face was hidden she tried to lift his head hanging over him calling to him in passionate entreaty and behold her hands and arms were drowned in blood his blood splashed her white peignoir it was all over her she seemed to be steeped in it as she sat on the floor trying to get a look at his face to see if his wound was mortal for some moments she had no other thought than to sit there in her horror repeating his name in every accent of terror and of love beseeching him to answer her then gradually came the conviction of his unconsciousness and of the need of help he was badly hurt dangerously hurt but it might not be mortal help must be got he must be cured somehow she could not believe that he was to die she rushed to the bell and rang again and again and again hardly taking her finger from the little ivory knob listening as the shrill electric peal vibrated through the silent house it seemed an age before there was any response and then three servants came hurrying in 
the butler and one of the footmen and a scared housemaid they saw her standing there tall and white dabbled with blood some one has been trying to murder him she cried didn't you hear a gun no no one had heard anything till they heard the bell the two men lifted sir godfrey from the floor to the sofa and did all they could to staunch that deadly wound in his neck from which the blood was still pouring a bullet wound lambert the butler was afraid that the bullet had pierced the jugular vein if there was life still it was only ebbing life juanita flung herself on the ground beside that prostrate form and kissed the unconscious lips and the cold brow and those pallid cheeks kissed and cried over him and repeated again and again that the wound was not mortal is any one going for the doctor she cried frantically are you all going to stand still and see him die lambert assured her that thomas was gone to the stable to wake the men and dispatch a mounted messenger for mr dolby the family doctor he might have helped us more if he had run there himself cried juanita there will be time lost in waking the men and saddling a horse i could go there faster she looked at the door as if she had half resolved to rush off to the village in her dressing-gown and slippers and then she looked again at that marble face and again fell upon her knees by the sofa and laid her cheek against that bloodless cheek and moaned and cried over him while the butler went to get brandy with but little hope in his own mind of any useful result what an end to a honeymoon he said to himself despondently End of chapter 5volume 1 chapter 6 of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 6 is not short pain well borne that brings long ease and lays the soul to sleep in quiet grave sleep after toil port after stormy seas ease after war death after life the morning dawned upon a weeping household there was nothing to be done when mr dolby the village surgeon arrived at sheraton house he could only examine the death wound and express his opinion as to its character it was certainly not self-inflicted he told the servants as they stood about him in a stony group self-inflicted indeed echoed lambert i should think not if there ever was a young man who had cause to set store by his life it was sir godfrey carmichael it's murder mr dolby rank murder yes i'm afraid it's murder said dolby with an air which implied that suicide would have been a bagatelle in comparison but who could have done it and why he asked after a pause the servants inclined to the opinion that it was the act of a poacher lord cheriton had always been what they called a mark upon poachers there was doubtless a vendetta to which the pheasant's staring fraternity had pledged themselves and sir godfrey was the victim of that vendetta however strange it might appear that hatred of lord cheriton should find its expression in the murder of lord cheriton's son-in-law we must wait for the inquest before we can know anything said dolby when he had done all that surgery could do for that cold clay which was to compose the lifeless form in its final rest in a spare bedroom at the end of the corridor remote from that bridal chamber where juanita was lying motionless in her dumb despair the local policeman was on the scene at seven o'clock prowling about the house with a countenance of solemn stolidity and asking questions which seemed to have very little direct bearing on the case and taking measurements between the spot where the murdered man had been found too plainly marked by the pool of blood which had soaked into the velvet pile and imaginary points upon the terrace outside with the doctor at his elbow to make suggestions and as far as in him lay behaving as a skilled london detective might have behaved under the same circumstances which conduct on his part did not prevent mr dolby telegraphing to scotland yard as soon as the wires were at his disposal he was in the village post-office when the clock struck eight and the postmistress who had hung out a flag and decorated her shop front with garlands on the wedding day was watching him with an awe-stricken countenance as he wrote his telegrams the first was to scotland yard sir godfrey carmichael murdered late last night send one of your most trustworthy men to investigate the second was to lord cheriton grand hotel parame st malo france sir godfrey carmichael was murdered last night between twelve and one o'clock murderer unknown death instantaneous pray come immediately the third was to matthew dalbrook more briefly announcing the murder 
he was going to send a fourth message to lady jane carmichael began to write her address then thought better of it and tore up the form i'll drive over and tell her he said to himself poor soul it will break her heart to let her learn how she may but it would be cruel to telegraph all the same every one at cheriton knew that lady jane's affections were centred upon her only son she had daughters and she was very fond of them they were both married and had married well but their homes lay far off one in the midlands the other in the north of england and although in each case there was a nursery full of grandchildren neither the young married woman nor the babies had ever filled lady jane's heart as her son had filled it and now mr dolby had taken upon himself to go and tell this gentle widow that the light of her life was extinguished that the son she adored had been brutally and inexplicably murdered it was a hard thing for any man to do and mr dolby was a warm-hearted man with home ties of his own before mr dolby's gig was halfway to swanage his telegram had been delivered at dorchester and matthew dalbrook and his son were starting for cheriton with a pair of horses in the solicitor's neat tea-cart which was usually driven with one theodore drove and father and son sat side by side in a dreary silence what could be said the telegram told so little they had speculated and wondered about it in brief broken sentences as they stood in the office fronting the sunny street waiting for the carriage they had asked each other if this ghastly thing could be if it were not some mad metamorphosis of words some blunder of a telegraph's clerk rather than a horrible reality murdered a man who had been sitting at their table full of life and spirits in the glow of youth and health and happiness less than twenty-four hours ago murdered a man who had never known what it was to have an enemy who had been popular with all classes had been how awful to think of him as belonging to the past he who yesterday looked forward to so radiant a future and theodore dalbrook had envied him as even the most generous of men must needs envy the winner in the race for love could it be or if it were really true how could it be what manner of murderer what motive for the murder where had it happened on the highway in the woody labyrinths of the chase and upon the mind of theodore flashed the same idea which had suggested itself to the servants it might be the work of a poacher whom sir godfrey had surprised during a late ramble yet a poacher must be hard bested before he resorts to murder and sir godfrey easy-tempered and generous was hardly the kind of man to take upon himself the functions of a gamekeeper and give chase to any casual depredator it was useless to wonder or to argue while the facts of the case were all unrevealed it would be time to do that when they were at cheriton so the father and son sat in dismal silence save that now and again the elder man sighed poor juanita my poor juanita and she was so happy yesterday theodore winced at the words yes she had been so happy and he had despaired because of her happiness the cup of gladness which had brimmed over for her had been to him a fountain of bitterness it seemed to him as if he had never realized how fondly he loved her till he saw her by her husband's side an embodiment of life's sunshine innocently revealing her felicity in every look and word it was so long since he had ceased to hope he had even taught himself to think he was resigned to his fate that he could live his life without her but that delusion ceased yesterday and he knew that she was dearer than she had ever been to him now that she was irrevocably lost it was human nature perhaps to love her best when love was most hopeless they drove along the level roads towards cheriton in the dewy freshness of the summer morning by meadow and copse by heath and cornfield the skylarks carolling in the hot blue sky the corncrake creaking inside the hedge the chaffinch reiterating his monotonous tone the jays screaming in the wood all living creatures revelling in the cloudless summer it was hard awful unsupportable that he who was with them yesterday who had driven along this road under the westering sun was now cold clay a subject for the coroner a something to be hidden away in the family vault and forgotten as soon as possible for what does consolation mean except persuasion to forget never had the way between dorchester and cheriton chase looked lovelier than in this morning atmosphere never had the cattle grouped themselves into more delightful pictures amidst those shallow waters which reflected the sky never had the lights and shadows been fairer upon those level meadows and yonder broken hills 
theodore dalbrook loved every bit of that familiar landscape and even to-day amidst the horror and wonder of his distracted thoughts he had a dim sense of surrounding beauty as of something seen in a dream he could have hardly told where he was or what the season was or whether it was the morning or the evening light that was gilding the fields yonder the lowered blinds at cheriton told only too surely that the ghastly announcement in the telegram was no clerical error the face of the footman who opened the door was pale with distress he conducted mr dalbrook and his son to the library where the butler appeared almost immediately to answer the elder man's eager questions not on the highway not in the woods or the park but in the drawing-room where the butler had seen him sitting in a low armchair by the open window in the tranquil summer night absorbed in his book he was that wrapped up that i don't believe he knew i was in the room sir said lambert till i asked him if there was anything further wanted for the night and then he starts looks up at me with his pleasant smile and answers in his quiet friendly way nothing more thank you lambert is it very late i told him it was past eleven and i asked him if i should shut the drawing-room shutters before i went to bed but he says no i'll see to that i like the windows open and then he went on reading and less than two hours afterwards he was lying on the ground in front of the window dead have you any suspicion lambert as to the murderer well no sir not unless it was a poacher or an escaped lunatic the lunatic seems rather the more probable conjecture said matthew dalbrook the police are at work already i hope well yes sir our local police are doing all that lies in their power and i have done what i could to assist them mr dolby wired to scotland yard at the same time as he wired to you that was wisely done have there been no traces of the murderer discovered no indication of any kind nothing sir but one of the under housemaids remembers to have heard footsteps about on the terrace after dark on several occasions within the last fortnight once while sir godfrey and our young lady were at dinner and two or three times at a later hour when they were in the drawing-room or the library did she see any one no sir she is rather a dull kind of girl and never so much as troubled to find out what the footsteps meant her bedroom is one of the old attics on the south side of the house and she was sitting at work near her open window when she heard the footsteps going and coming slow and stealthy like upon the terrace at intervals she is sure they were not her ladyship's nor sir godfrey's steps on either occasion she says she knows their walk and she would swear to these footsteps as altogether different slower more creeping like as she puts it has no one been seen lurking about after dark no one sir as we have heard of and the constable questioned all the servants pretty close i can tell you he hasn't left much for the london detective to do matthew dalbrook had been the only questioner in this interrogatory theodore had sunk into a chair on entering the room and sat silent with a face of marble he was thinking of the stricken girl whose life had been desolated by this mysterious crime his father had not forgotten her but he had wanted first of all to learn all he could about her husband's death how does lady carmichael bear it he asked presently very sadly sir very sadly mrs morley and celestine are both with her mr dolby ordered that she should be kept as quiet as possible not allowed to leave her room if they could help it but it has been very difficult to keep her quiet poor dear young lady she wanted to go to him poor girl poor girl so happy yesterday said matthew dalbrook his son sat silent as if he were made of stone far very far off as it were at the end of a long dark vista cut sharply across an impenetrable wood of choking thorns and blinding briars he saw juanita again radiant again happy again loving and beloved and on the threshold of another life the vision dazzled him almost to blindness but could it ever be could that loving heart ever forget this agony of to-day ever beat again to a joyful measure he wrenched himself from that selfish reverie he felt a wretch for having yielded up his imagination even for a moment to that alluring vision he was here to mourn with her here to pity her to sympathize with this unspeakable grief murdered 
her lover husband shot to death by an unknown hand her honeymoon ended with one murderous flash that honeymoon which had seemed the prelude to a lifetime of love i should like to see her said mr dalbrook i think it would be a comfort to her to see me however agitated she may be will you take my name to the housekeeper and ask her opinion lambert looked doubtful as to the wisdom of the course but was ready to obey all the same mr dolby said she was to be kept very quiet sir that she wasn't to see anybody that could hardly apply to her own people mr dolby telegraphed for me did he sir then i conclude he would not object to her ladyship seeing you i'll send up your name perhaps while the message is being taken you would like to have a look at the spot where it happened yes i want to know all that can be known lambert had been so busy with the constable all the morning that he felt himself almost on a level with scotland yard talent and he took a morbid interest in that dark stain on the delicate half tints of the velvet pile and in such few details as he was able to expound he dispatched a footman upstairs and he led the dalbrooks to the drawing-room where he opened the shutters of that window through which the assassin must have aimed and let a flood of sunshine into the darkened room the chair the table and lamp stood exactly as they had stood last night lambert took credit to himself for not having allowed them to be moved by so much as an inch any assistance in my power i shall be only too happy to give to the london detective he said of course coming on the scene as a total stranger he can't be expected to do much without help there was no need to point out that ghastly stain upon the carpet the shaft of noonday sunshine seemed to concentrate its brightness on that grisly patch dark 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 with the witness of a cruel murder the murder of a man who had never done an unkindly act or harboured an unworthy thought theodore dalbrook stood looking at that stain it seemed to bring the fatal reality nearer to him he looked at the low chair with its covering of peacock plush and its turkish embroidery draped daintily across the broad back and capacious arms a chair to live in a sybarite's estate and then at the satinwood book-table filled with such books as the lounger loves southey's doctor burton table talk by coleridge waitley rogers the sentimental journey rochefoucauld Caxtoniana, Ilia, and thrown carelessly upon one of the shelves a handkerchief of cobweb cambric with a monogram that occupied a third of the fabric j c her handkerchief dropped there last night as she arranged the books for her husband's use putting her own favourites in his way lambert took up a book and opened it with a dismal smile handing it to mr dalbrook as he did so it was a wider horizons the volume he had been reading when the bullet struck him and those open pages were spattered with his blood put it away for god's sake man cried dalbrook horrified whatever you do don't let lady carmichael see it no sir better not perhaps sir but it's evidence and it ought to be produced at the inquest produce if you like but there is evidence enough to show that he was murdered on this spot as he sat reading sir the book is a great point and then lambert expounded the position of that lifeless form making much of every detail as he had done to the constable while he was talking the door was opened suddenly and juanita rushed into the room lord have mercy on us she mustn't see that cried lambert pointing to the carpet matthew dalbrook hurried forward to meet her and caught her in his arms before she could reach that fatal spot he held her there looking at her with pitying eyes while theodore approached slowly silently agonized by the sight of her agony the change from the joyous self-abandonment of yesterday to the rigid horror of to-day was the most appalling transformation that he had ever looked upon her face was of a livid pallor her large dark eyes were distended and fixed and all their brilliancy was quenched like a light blown out her blanched lips trembled as she tried to speak and it was after several futile efforts to express her meaning that she finally succeeded in shaping a sentence distinctly have they found his murderer not yet dearest it is far too soon to hope for that but it is not for you to think about that juanita all will be done be sure rest secure in the devotion of those who love you and with a break in his voice who loved him 
she lifted her head quickly with an angry light in the eyes which had been so dull till that moment do you think i will leave that work to others she said it is my business it is all that god has left me to do in this world it is my business to see that his murderer suffers not as i suffer that can never be but all that the law can do the law which is so merciful to murderers nowadays you don't think he can get off lightly do you uncle they will hang him won't they hang him hang him hang him she repeated in hoarse dull syllables a few moments agony after a night of terror so little so little and i have to live my desolate life my punishment is for a lifetime my love god will be good to you he can lighten all burdens murmured dalbrook gently he cannot lighten mine not by the weight of a single hair he has stretched forth his hand against me in hatred and anger perhaps because i loved his creature better than i loved him my dearest this is madness i did i did she reiterated i loved my husband better than i loved my god i would have worshipped satan if i could have saved him by satan's help i loved him with all my heart my mind and strength as we were taught to love god there was not room in my heart for any other religion he was the beginning and the end of my creed and god saw my happy love and hated me for it he is a jealous god we are taught that when we are little children he is a jealous god and he put it into the head of some distracted creature to come to that window and shoot my husband a violent fit of hysteria followed these wild words matthew dalbrook felt that all attempts at consolation must needs be vain for some time to come until this tempest of grief was calmed nothing could be done she will have her mother here in a day or two said theodore that may bring some comfort juanita heard him even in the midst of her hysterical sobbing her hearing was abnormally keen no one no one can comfort me unless they can give me back my dead she started up suddenly from the sofa where matthew had placed her and grasped his arm with convulsive force take me to him she entreated take me to him uncle you were always kind to me they won't let me go to him it is brutal it is infamous of them i have a right to be there by and by my dear girl when you are calmer i will be calm this instant if you will take me to him she said commanding herself at once with a tremendous effort choking down those rising sobs clasping her convulsed throat with constraining hands tightening her tremulous lips see she said i am quite calm now i will not give way again take me to him let me see him that i may be sure my happy life was not all a dream a mad woman's dream as it seems to have been now when i cannot look upon his face mr dalbrook looked at his son interrogatively let her see him said theodore gently we cannot lessen her sorrow it must have its way better perhaps that she should see him and accustom herself to her grief better for her brain however it may torture her heart he saw the risk of a further calamity in his cousin's state the fear that her mind would succumb under the burden of her sorrow it seemed to him that there was more danger in thwarting her natural desire to look upon her beloved dead than in letting her have her way the housekeeper had followed her young mistress to the drawing-room and was waiting there she shook her head and murmured something about mr dolby's orders but submitted to the authority of a kinsman and family solicitor as even superior to the faculty she led the way silently to that upper chamber where the murdered man was lying matthew dalbrook put his cousin's icy hand through his arm and supported her steps as they slowly followed theodore remained in the drawing-room walking up and down in deepest thought stopping now and then in his slow pacing to and fro to contemplate that stain upon the velvet pile and the empty chair beside it in the room above juanita knelt beside the bed where he who kissed her last night on the threshold of her chamber lay in his last slumber a marble figure with calm dead face shrouded by the snowy sheet with flowers white waxen exotics scattered about the bed she lifted the sheet and looked upon him 
and kissed him with love's last despairing kiss and then she knelt beside the bed with her face bent in her clasped hands calmer than she had been at any moment since she found her murdered husband lying at her feet it's wonderful whispered the housekeeper to mr dalbrook it seems to have soothed her poor dear to see him and i was afraid she would have broke down worse than ever you must give way to her a little mrs morley she has a powerful mind and she must not be treated like a child she will live through her trouble and rise superior to it be sure of that terrible as it is the door opened softly and a woman came into the room a woman of about five-and-forty of middle height slim and delicately made with aquiline nose and fair complexion and flaxen hair just touched with grey she was deadly pale but her eyes were tearless and she came quietly to the bed and fell on her knees by juanita's side and hid her face as juanita's was hidden and the first sound that came from her lips was a long low moan a sound of greater agony than matthew dalbrook had ever heard in his life until that moment good god he muttered to himself as he moved to a distant window i had forgotten lady jane it was lady jane the gentle soul who had loved that poor clay with a love that had grown and strengthened with every year of his life with a love that had won liberal response from the recipient there had never been a cloud between them never one moment of disagreement or doubt each had been secure in the certainty of the other's affection it had been a union such as is not often seen between mother and son and it was ended ended by the red hand of murder matthew dalbrook left the room in silence beckoning to the housekeeper to follow him leave them together he said they will be more comfort to each other than any one else in the world can be to either of them keep in the way here in the corridor in case of anything going wrong fainting or hysterics for instance but so long as they are tolerably calm let them be together and undisturbed he went back to his son and they both left the house soon afterwards and drove off to find the coroner and to confer with him later in the afternoon they saw the local policeman whose discoveries though he evidently thought them important mr dalbrook considered nil he had found out that a certain village freebooter ostensibly an agricultural labourer nocturnally a poacher bore a grudge against lord cheriton and had sworn to be even with him sooner or later the constable opined that being an ignorant man this person might have mistaken lord cheriton's son-in-law for lord cheriton himself he had discovered in the second place that two vans of gipsies had encamped just outside the chase on the night after the arrival of the bridal pair they were in fact the very gipsies who had provided aunt sally and the french shooting gallery for the amusement of the populace and he opined that some of these gipsies were in it why they should be in it he did not take upon himself to explain but he declared that his experience of the tribe justified his suspicions he was also of opinion that the murderer had come with the intent to plunder the drawing-room which was in his own expression chock full of valuables and that being disappointed and furthermore detected in that intent he had tried to make all things safe by a casual murder but man alive sir godfrey was sitting in his armchair absorbed in his book there was nothing to prevent any intending burglar sneaking away unseen you must find some better scent than that if you mean to track the murderer i hope sir with my experience of the district i shall have a better chance of finding him than a stranger imported from the metropolis said constable barber severely i conclude there will be a reward offered mr dalbrook there will and a large one i must not take upon myself to name the figure lord cheriton will be here to-morrow or next day and he will no doubt take immediate steps you may consider yourself a very lucky man barber if you can solve this mystery matthew dalbrook turned from the eager face of the police officer with a short angry sigh it was of the reward the man was thinking no doubt congratulating himself perhaps upon the good luck which had thrown such a murder in his way and presently the man from scotland yard would be on the scene keen and business-like yet full of a sportsman's ardour intent on discovery as on a game in which the stakes were worth winning little cared either of these for the one fair life cut short for the other young life blighted end of chapter six volume one chapter seven of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven 
i saw a fury wetting a death dart lord sheraton liked to take his summer holiday on a sunny seashore where there were not many english visitors parame st malo fulfilled both these conditions it afforded him a vast expanse of golden sands firm beneath his foot steeped in sunshine for the most part on which to pace to and fro lifting his eyes dreamily now and then to the sea-girt city with its stony rampart and its quaint louis quatorze mansions facing the sea in the sober dignity of massive stone facade and tall windows gray old houses which seem too good for the age in which they find themselves solid enough to last through long centuries and to outlive all that yet lingers at that grandiose france in which they were built roof above roof rises the breton city steep old streets leading up to cathedral and municipal palace with the crocketed steeple for its pinnacle shining with a pale brilliance in the summer sunlight verdureless and with but little colour save the reflected glory of the skies and the jasper green of the sea in its ring of golden sand lord sheraton affected parame because though it was within a summer night's journey from his own isle of purbeck it was thoroughly out of the beaten track and he was tolerably secure from those hourly encounters with his most particular friends to which he must have submitted at baden or spa at trouville or dieppe parame was parisian or nothing the smart people all came from paris english smartness had its centre at dinard and the english who patronize dinard will tell you there is no other paradise on earth and that its winter climate is better than that of the riviera if people would only have faith so long as the cheritons could keep out of the way of exploring friends from dinard his lordship was exempt from the amusements which to some minds make life intolerable lady cheriton was distinctly social in her instincts and looked dinard wards sometimes from her lotus land with a longing eye she would have liked to ask some nice people to luncheon and she knew so many nice people at dinard she would have liked to organize excursions to mont saint michel or up the rance to dinan she would have liked to plunge into all manner of innocent gaieties but her husband stamped out these genial yearnings it seems such a pity not to have people over to dinner when there are such nice operettas and vaudevilles every night at the casino she sighed and if you had them over to dinner how do you suppose they would get back asked her husband sternly would you wish to keep them all till next morning and be bored with them at breakfast that intervening strip of sea narrow as it was afforded unspeakable comfort to lord cheriton it was an excuse for refusing to go over and take afternoon tea with people he was supposed to hold in his heart of hearts in the way of friendship you can go maria if you like he told his wife but i am not a good sailor and i came here on purpose to be quiet this was his lordship's answer to every hospitable suggestion he had come to parame for rest and not for gadding about or entertainments of any kind so the long summer days succeeded each other in a lazy monotony and whatever gaiety there might be in the great white hotel the english law lord and his wife had no share in it they occupied a suite of light airy rooms in the west pavilion and were served apart from the vulgar herd after the fashion which befitted a person of lord cheriton's distinction they had only their body servants man and maid so they were waited upon by the servants of the hotel and they drove about the dusty level roads between st servant and dole in a hired landau driven by a breton coachman lady cheriton was dull but contented she had always submitted to her husband's pleasure he had been a very indulgent husband in essentials and he had made her a peeress her married life had been eminently satisfactory and she could afford to endure one summer month of monotony amidst pleasant surroundings she dropped in at the casino every evening while lord cheriton read the papers in the seclusion of his salon with the large french window wide open to the blue sea and the blue moonlight hearing the tramp of feet on the terrace or the sea-wall beyond or now and again strains of lively music from the theatre where the little opera company from paris were singing lecoq's joyous music people used to turn round to look at lady cheriton as she walked gravely between the rows of seats to her place near the orchestra his lordship's valet following with an extra shawl an opera-glass and a footstool he established her in her chair and then retired discreetly to the back of the theatre to await her departure and to escort her safely back to the hotel he was a large serious-looking man a french swiss who had lived ten years in italy and over fifteen years in lord sheraton's service and who spoke french italian german and english indifferently lady cheriton was handsome still with a grand spanish beauty which time had touched lightly 
she was tall and dignified in carriage though a shade stouter than she could have wished and she dressed to perfection with sobriety of colouring and richness of material her life had been full of pleasantness her only sorrow being the loss of her infant sons which she had not taken to heart so deeply as the proud father who had pined for an heir to his newly won honours she had her daughter her first-born the child for whom her heart had first throbbed with the strange new love of maternity she shed some natural tears for the boy babies and then she let juanita fill their place in her heart and her life again seemed complete in its sum of happiness and now in this sleepy summer holiday cut off from most things that she cared for juanita's letters had been her chief joy those happy innocent girlish letters overflowing with fond foolish praise of the husband she loved letters made up of nothings of what he had said to her and what she had said to him and where they had taken afternoon tea and of their morning ride or their evening walk and of those plans for the long future which they were always making projecting their thoughts into the time to come and laying out those after years as if they were a certainty there had been no fairer morning than that which followed the night of the murder lord cheriton was an early riser at all seasons most of all in the summer when he was generally awake from five o'clock and had to beguile an hour or so with one of the books on the table by his bed a well-thumbed horace or a duodecimo don quixote in ten volumes which went everywhere with him by seven o'clock he was dressed and ready to begin the day and between that hour and breakfast it was his habit to attend to the correspondence which had accumulated during the previous day this severe rule was suspended however at parame and he gave himself up to restful vacuity strolling up and down the sands or walking round the walls of st malo or sauntering into the cathedral in a casual way for an early mass enjoying the atmosphere of the place with its old world flavour on this particular morning he went no further than the sands where he paced slowly to and fro in front of the long white terrace hotel and casino heedless alike of parisian idleness coquetting with the crisp wavelets on the edge of the sea and of the mounted officer yonder drilling his men upon the sandy flat towards st malo he was in a mood for idleness but with him idleness was only a synonym for deep thought he was meditating upon his only child's future and telling himself that he had done well for her sir godfrey carmichael would be made baron cheriton in the days to come when he the first baron should be laid in the newly built vault in the cemetery outside dorchester he was not going to sever himself from his kindred in that last sleep albeit they were common folk he would lie under the egyptian sarcophagus which he had set up in honour of his father the crockery dealer and his mother the busy anxious housewife the sarcophagus was plain and unpretentious hardly too good for the shopkeeper yet with a certain solid dignity which was not unbefitting the law-lord almost as massive as that mammoth cross which marks the resting-place of henry brougham in the fair southern land he had chosen the monument with uttermost care so that it might serve the double purpose he had looked at the broad blank panel many a time wondering how his own name would look upon it and whether his daughter would have a laurel wreath sculptured above it it might be that admiring friends would suggest his being laid in the abbey hard by those shabby disused courts where he had pleaded and sat in judgment through so many laborious years and it might be that the suggestion would be accepted by dean and chapter and that the panel on the dorchester sarcophagus would remain blank james dalbrook knew that he had deserved well of posterity and above all of the ruling powers he had been staunch and unwavering in his adherence to his own party and he knew that he had a strong claim upon any conservative ministry he had sounded those in authority and he had been assured that there would be very little difficulty in getting sir godfrey carmichael a peerage by and by when he lord cheriton should be no more sir godfrey's family was one of the oldest in the country and he had but to deserve well of his party when he had got his seat to ensure future favours as the owner of the cheriton and millbrook estates he would be a worthy candidate for one of those coronets which seem to be dealt round so freely by expiring ministries as it were a dying father dividing his treasures among his weeping children so far as any man can think with satisfaction of the days when he shall be no more and when this world will go on badly of course but somehow without him lord cheriton thought of those far-off years when godfrey carmichael should be owner of cheriton chase the young man had shown such fine qualities of heart and mind and above all had given such unobtrusive evidence of his affection for juanita's father that the elder man must needs give measure for measure therefore godfrey had been to lord cheriton almost as a son 
the union of his humbly born daughter with one of the oldest families in the south of england gratified the pride of the self-made man his own pedigree might be of the lowliest but his grandson would be able to look back upon a long line of ancestors glorified by many a patrician alliance strong and stern as was the fabric of james dalbrook's mind he was not superior to the englishman's foible and he loved rank and ancient lineage he was a tory to the core of his heart and it was the earnestness and thoroughness of his convictions which had given him weight with his party wherever he spoke or whatever he wrote and he had written much upon current politics in the saturday review and the higher class monthlies bore the stamp of a cromwellian vigour and a cromwellian sincerity he had never felt more at ease than upon that balmy summer morning pacing those golden sands in quiet meditation brooding over juanita's last letter received overnight with its girlish raptures its girlish dreams picturing her in the near future as happy a mother as she was a bride with his grandson the third baron cheriton of the future in her lap he smiled at his own foolishness in thinking of that first boy baby by the title which was but one of the possibilities of a foreshadowed sequence of events yet he found himself repeating the words idly to the rhythm of the wavelets that curled and sparkled near his feet third baron cheriton godfrey dalbrook carmichael third baron cheriton the cathedral clock was striking nine as he went into the hotel the light breakfast of coffee and rolls was laid on a small round table near the window lady cheriton was sitting in a recess between the massive stone columns which supported the balcony above reading yesterday's morning post in her soft grey cashmere peignoir whose flowing lines gave dignity to her figure her dark hair as yet untouched by time was arranged with an elegant simplicity the fine old lace about her throat harmonized admirably with the pale olive of her complexion she looked up at her husband with her placid smile and gave him her hand in affectionate greeting what a morning james one feels it a privilege to live what a superb day it would be for mont saint michel a thirty-mile drive in the dust do you really think that it is the best use to which to put a summer day you may be sure there will be plenty of worthy people of the same opinion and that the rock will swarm with cheap tourists and pretty little madame poulard will be put to the pin of her collar to feed them all she had seated herself at the table by this time and was pouring out coffee with a leisurely air smiling at her husband all the time thinking him the greatest and wisest of men even when he restrained her social instincts she was never tired of looking at that massive face with its clearly defined features sharply cut jaw and large grey eyes dark and deep as the eyes of the earnest thinker rather than the shrewd observer the strong projection of the lower brow indicated keen perceptions and the power of rapid judgment but above the perceptive organs the upper brow towered majestically giving the promise of a mind predominant in the regions of thought and imagination such a brow as we look upon with reverence in the portraits of walter scott intellectually the brow was equal to scott's morally there was something wanting neither benevolence nor veneration was on a par with the reasoning faculties tory principles with lord cheriton were not so much the result of an upward-looking nature as they were with scott this at least is the opinion at which a phrenologist might have arrived after a careful contemplation of that powerful brow lord cheriton sipped his coffee and leaned back in his armchair with his face to the morning sea he sat in a lazy attitude still thoughtful with those pleasant thoughts which are the repose of the working man's brain the tide was going out the rocky islet stood high out of the water the sands were widening till it seemed almost as if the sea were vanishing altogether from this beautiful day i suppose they will finish their honeymoon in a week or two and move on to the priory said lord cheriton by and by revealing the subject of his reverie yes juanita says we may go home as early as the second week in august if we like she is to be at the priory in time to settle down before the shooting begins they will have visitors in september his sisters don't you know the morningsides and the grenvilles and the children and nurses a houseful lady jane ought to be there to help her to entertain i don't think nita will want any help she will be mistress of the situation depend upon it and would be there were forty married sisters with their husbands and belongings she seemed to be mistress of us all at cheriton she is so clever sighed the mother remembering that cheriton house would no longer be under that girlish sovereignty the grave-looking french swiss valet appeared with a telegram on a salver who can have sent me a petit bleu 
exclaimed lord cheriton who was accustomed to receive a good many of those little blue envelopes when he was in paris but expected no such communications at st malo before leaving for his holiday he had impressed upon land steward and house steward that he was not to be bothered about anything if there is anything wanted you will communicate with messrs dalbrook he said they have full powers and yet here was some worrying message some question about a lease or an agreement or somebody's chimney had fallen through the roof he opened the little envelope with a vexed air resentful of unexpected annoyance he read the message and then sat blankly staring read again and rose from his seat suddenly with a cry of horror never in his life had he experienced such a shock never had those iron nerves that heart burned hard in the furnace of this world's strife been so tried he stood aghast and could only give the little paper with its type-printed syllables to his scared wife while he stood gazing at summer sky and summer sea in a blank helplessness realizing dimly that something had happened which must change the whole course of the future and overthrow every plan he had ever made the third baron cheriton strange but in that awful moment the words he had repeated idly on the sands half an hour ago echoed again in his ear alas he felt as if that title for which he had toiled was already extinct he saw as in a vision the velvet cap and golden coronet upon the coffin lid as the first and last lord cheriton was carried to his grave that prophetic vision must needs be realized within a few years there would be no one to succeed him murdered why by whom what devil had been conjured out of hell to cut short that honest stainless life what had godfrey carmichael done that a murderer's hand should be raised against him lady cheriton's softer nature found relief in tears before the day was done tears and agonized pacings up and down those rooms where life had been so placid in the sunlight agonized supplications that god would take pity upon her widowed girl so young and so happy and a widow a widow before her nineteenth birthday wailed the mother lord cheriton's grief was of a sterner kind and found no outlet in words he held a brief consultation with his valet a soldierly-looking man who had fought under garibaldi in burgundy when the guerilla captain made his brilliant endeavour to save sinking france they looked at time-tables and calculated hours the express to paris would not arrive in time for the evening mail via calais and dover it was saturday the cargo boat would cross to southampton that night and influence would obtain the accommodation for his lordship and party on board her the valet took a fly and drove off to the quay to find the southwestern superintendent and secure a private cabin for his master and mistress they would have the boat to themselves and would be at southampton at seven o'clock next morning and at cheriton before noon even if it were necessary to engage a special engine to take them there lord cheriton telegraphed to his daughter your mother and i will be with you to-morrow morning be brave for our sakes remember that you are all we have to live for another telegram to the house steward ordered a closed carriage to be in attendance at wareham station at ten o'clock on sunday morning how quietly you bear it james his wife told lord cheriton wonderingly when the mode of their return had been arranged and her maid was packing her trunks with those soberly handsome gowns which had been the wonder of many a butterfly parisienne she called him by his christian name now as in their earliest years of wedded life it was only on ceremonious occasions and when the eye of society was upon her that she addressed him by his title that stern quietude of his the fine features set and rigid frightened her more than a loquacious grief would have done and yet she hardly knew whether he felt the calamity too much for words or whether he did not feel it enough poor godfrey she sighed he was so good to me in all that a son could have been murdered my god my god how horrible if it had been any other kind of death one might bear it and yet that he should die at all would be too dreadful so young so handsome cut off in the flower of his days and she loved him so she has loved him all her life what will become of her without him what will become of her that was the mother's moaning cry all through that dreary day lord cheriton paced the sands as far as he could go from that giddy multitude in front of the sea-wall beyond the little rocky ridge by the pleasant hotel des bains where the young mothers and nurses and children and homely easy-going visitors congregate away towards cancale where all was loneliness 
he walked up and down meditating upon his blighted hopes he knew now that he had loved this young man almost as well as he loved his own daughter and that his death had shattered as fair a fabric as ever ambition built on the further side of the grave she will go in mourning for him all the days of my life perhaps he thought and then some day after i am in my grave she will fall in love with an adventurer and the estate i love and the fortune i have saved will be squandered on the turf or thrown away at monte carlo a grim smile curled his lip at a grim thought as he paced that lonely shore beyond the jutting cliff and the villa on the point i am sorry i left the bench when i did he thought it would have been something to have put on the black cap and passed sentence upon that poor lad's murderer who was his murderer and what the motive of the crime those were questions which lord cheriton had been asking himself with maddening iteration through that intolerable summer day he welcomed the fading sunlight of late afternoon he could eat nothing would not even sit down to make a pretence of dining but waited chafing in the great stone hall of the hotel for the carriage that was to take him and his wife to the steamer End of chapter seven volume one chapter eight of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the stars move still time runs the clock will strike trains were favourable and there was no necessity for a special engine to carry lord cheriton and his wife to the house of mourning it was not yet noon when the closed landau drove in at the chief gate of the park not that side gate in the deep rocky lane of which mrs porter was custodian one of the gardeners lived at the lodge and it was he who opened the gate this sunday morning lord cheriton stopped the carriage to question him he had heard a full account of the murder already from the station-master at wareham have they found the murderer he asked no my lord i'm afraid they're not likely to begging your lordship's pardon for venturing an opinion the man was an old servant and altogether a superior person were the gates locked at the usual time on friday night yes my lord the gates were locked but that wouldn't keep out a foot passenger there's the turnstile in the lane of course yes yes a london detective has been at work i hear yes my lord came yesterday before two o'clock and has been about with barber ever since and have they discovered nothing nothing my lord or if they have it has been kept dark lord cheriton asked no further questions the man was right a detective from scotland yard was not likely to talk about any minor discoveries that he might have made only the one grand discovery of the guilty man would have been made known five minutes later the carriage drew up in front of the hall door what a blank and melancholy look the fine old house had with all the windows darkened it did not look so dismal as a london house with its level rows of windows and its flat facade would have looked under similar conditions for here there was variety of mullion and moulding bay windows and oriel dormer and lattice and over all the growth of lovely creeping plants starry clematis and passion flower clustering banskia roses and waxen magnolia an infinite beauty of form and colour yet the blind windows were there with their dull dead look and chilling suggestion of death lady cheriton looked at the house for a moment or so as she got out of the carriage and then burst into tears it seemed to her as if she had scarcely realized the stern reality till that moment she went straight to her daughter's boudoir a room with an oriel window looking across the wide expanse of the park where the turf lay openest to the sunshine and where the deer were wont to congregate the garden was at its narrowest point just below this window and consisted only of a broad gravel path and a strip of flowers at the top of a steep grass bank that sloped down to the ha-ha which divided garden and park the room was full of juanita's girlish treasures evidences of fancies that had passed like summer clouds accomplishments begun and abandoned a zither in one corner a guitar and a mandolin against the wall an easel in front of one window a gigantic rushwork basket lined with amber satin and crammed with all manner of silks wools scraps and unfinished undertakings in another the room remained just as she had left it when she went to london at the beginning of may she had not occupied it during her honeymoon and perhaps that was the reason she was here now in her desolation sitting silent statue-like with lady jane by her side on a sofa opposite the oriel 
she lifted her eyelids when her mother came into the room and looked up at her in speechless despair she uttered no word of greeting but sat dumbly lady cheriton went over to her and knelt by her side and then feebly automatically the widowed girl put her limp cold hand into her mother's and hid her bloodless face upon her mother's breast lady cheriton held her there with one hand while she stretched out her other hand to lady jane dear lady jane how good of you to be with her to comfort her where else should i be i want to be near him the gentle blue eyes filled with tears the gracious head trembled a little then came a long shivering sigh and silence the mother knelt beside the sofa with her child's head leaning forward upon her matronly bosom there may have been some comfort perhaps in that contact some recurrence of the thoughts and feelings of earlier years when the mother could console every grief and soothe every pain no words came to either of those mourners what could be said in mitigation of a sorrow that seemed to offer no point of relief no counterbalancing good there was nothing to be done but to sit still and suffer the silence lasted long and then juanita lifted her head suddenly from its heavy repose and looked fixedly in her mother's face my father has come back with you she asked yes dearest we did not lose an hour had there been any quicker way of travelling we would have been here sooner my father will be able to find the murderer said juanita scarcely hearing her mother's words intent upon her own thought a great lawyer as he was a judge too he must be able to trace the murderer to bring him to justice to take a life for a life oh god with a shrill agonizing cry could a thousand lives give me back one hour of that one life yet it will be something something to know that his murderer has been killed killed shamefully in cold blood in the broad light of day o oh god thou avenger of wrong make his last hours bitter to him make his last moments hopeless let him see the gates of hell opening before him when he stands trembling with the rope round his neck there was an intensity of hatred in this vindictive appeal which thrilled the two listeners with an icy horror it was like a blast from a frozen region blowing suddenly in their faces and they shivered as they heard could it be the girl they knew the loving lovable girl who in those deep harsh tones called upon her god for vengeance and not for mercy oh my love my poor heart-broken love pray to him to have pity upon us ask him to teach us how to bow to the rod how to bear his chastisement that is the lesson we have to learn pleaded lady jane tearful and submissive even in the depth of sorrow is it my lesson is to see justice done upon the wretch who killed my husband the malignant the merciless devil there was not one of those slayers of women and children in the indian mutiny worse than the man who killed my love what had he done he the kindest and best generous frank pitiful to all who ever came in his way what had he done to provoke any man's enmity oh god when i remember how good he was and how much brighter and better the world was for having him she began to pace the room as she had paced it again and again in her slow hours of agony her hands clasped above her dishevelled head her great dark eyes so dove-like in their hours of love and happiness burning with an angry light lurid almost in the excitement of her fevered brain there had been times when lady jane had feared that reason must give way altogether amidst this wild delirium of grief she had stayed to watch and to console forgetting her own broken heart putting aside all considerations of her own sorrow as something that might have its way afterwards in order to comfort this passionate mourner comfort even from affection such as this was unavailing now and again the girl turned her burning eyes upon the mother's pale resigned face and for a moment a thought of that chastened gentle grief softened her dear dear lady jane god made you better than any other woman on this earth i believe she cried amidst her anguish the saints and martyrs must have been like you but i am not i am not made like that i cannot kiss the rod the meeting between juanita and her father was more painful to him than to her she hung upon his neck in feverish excitement imploring him to avenge her husband you can do it she urged you who are so clever must know how to bring the murderer's guilt home to him you will find him will you not father he cannot have gone out of the country yet think it was only friday i was a happy woman upon friday 
only think of that happy sitting by godfrey's side in the phaeton driving through the sunset and thinking how beautiful the world was and what a privilege it was to live i had no more foreboding than the skylark had singing above our heads and in less than an hour after midnight my darling was dead oh god how sudden i cannot even remember his last words he kissed me as he left at my bedroom door kissed me and said something i cannot remember what it was but i can hear the sound of his voice still i shall hear it all my life lord cheriton let her ramble on he had alas so little to say to her such sorry comfort to offer only words mere words which must needs sound idle and hollow in the ear of grief frame his consolatory speeches with what eloquence he might he could do nothing for her since he could not give her back her dead this wild cry for vengeance shocked him from those young lips yet it was natural perhaps he too would give much to see the assassin suffer he too felt that the dock and the gallows would be too trivial a punishment for that accursed deed he had looked upon the marble face of him who was to have been the second baron cheriton looked upon it in its placid repose and had sworn within himself to do all that ingenuity could do to avenge that cruel murder he could not have had an enemy he told himself unless it was some wretch who hated him for being happy and beloved he had a long talk with mr luke churton the london detective who had exhausted all his means without arriving at any satisfactory result i confess my lord that i am altogether at a standstill said mr churton when he had related all that he had done since his arrival on the scene early on saturday afternoon the utmost information i have been able to obtain leaves me without one definite idea there is no one in the neighbourhood open to suspicion so far as i can make out for i am sure your lordship will agree with me that your butler's notion of a poacher resenting your treatment by the murder of your son-in-law is much too thin one cannot accept such a notion as that for a moment said mr churton shaking his head no that is an untenable idea no doubt the next suggestion is that some person was prowling about with the intention of abstracting trinkets and other valuables from the drawing-room in an unguarded moment when the room might happen to be empty and i admit that the present fashion of covering drawing-room tables and cabinets with valuables of every description is calculated to suggest plunder but that kind of thing would be probable enough in london rather than in the country and nothing is more unlikely than that a prowler of that order would resort to murder again the manner in which the body was found with the open book lying close to the hand that had held it goes far to prove that sir godfrey was shot as he sat reading and at a time when a burglar could have no motive for shooting him do you think it was the act of a lunatic no my lord for in that event the murderer would have been heard of or found before now the gardens park and chase have been most thoroughly searched under my superintendence it is not possible for a lap-dog to be hidden anywhere within this domain the neighbouring villages solitary cottages commons and copses have been also submitted to a searching investigation the police all over the country are on the alert of course the crime is still of very recent date time to us seems longer than it really is no doubt no doubt i can find no other hypothesis than that the act was done by a madman such a motiveless murder a man sitting by a window reading shot by an unknown hand from a garden terrace remote from the outer world were we in ireland the crime might seem commonplace enough sir godfrey was a landowner and that alone is an offence against the idle and the lawless in that unhappy country but here in the midst of an orderly god-fearing population had sir godfrey no enemy do you think my lord asked the detective gravely the crime has the look of a vendetta there never was a young man owner of a considerable estate more universally beloved his tenants adore him for as a landlord he has been exceptionally indulgent he may have granted too much in some quarters and too little in others no no he has been judicious in his liberality and he has a capital bailiff an old man who was a servant on this estate many years ago but there are other influences said the detective musingly whenever i meet with a crime of this kind motiveless apparently i remember the eastern prince i think he was one of those long-headed orientals wasn't he my lord who used to ask who is she in a thoroughly dark case i always suspect a woman behind the curtain 
sir godfrey had been independent of all control for a good many years and a young man of fortune handsome open-hearted with only a mother to look after him well my lord you know the kind of thing that generally happens in such cases you mean that my son-in-law may have been involved in some disreputable intrigue i don't say disreputable my lord but i venture to suggest that there may have been some ahem some awkward entanglement with a married woman for instance and the husband or another lover may have belonged to the criminal classes there are men who think very little of murder when they fancy themselves ill-used by a woman half the midnight brawls and nearly half the murders in the metropolis are caused by jealousy i know what a large factor that is in the sum total of crime and unless you are sure there was no entanglement i am sure as i can be of anything outside my own existence i don't believe that sir godfrey ever cared for any woman in his life except my daughter he might not have cared my lord but he might have been drawn in suggested mr churton young men are apt to be weak where women are concerned and women know that unfortunately and they don't scruple to use their power not the best of em even young men are apt to be weak yes lord cheriton had seen enough of the world to know that this was true it was just possible that in that young life which seemed white as snow to the eye of kindred and friends there had been one dark secret one corroding stain temptation yielded to promises given never to be fulfilled such things have been in many lives in most lives perhaps could we know all lord cheriton thought as he sat silently meditating upon the detective's suggestions lady jane might know something about her son's past perhaps something that she might have kept locked in the beneficent maternal heart he determined to sound her delicately at the earliest opportunity but on being sounded lady jane repudiated any such possibility no again and again no his youth had been spotless no hint of an intrigue had ever reached her from any quarter he had chosen his friends among the most honourable young men at the university his amusements had been such as became a young englishman of exalted position he had never stooped to low associations or even doubtful company and from his boyhood upwards he had adored juanita that love alone would have kept him right said lady jane but i do not believe that it was in his nature to go wrong it would seem therefore that the detective's suspicion was groundless jealousy could not have been the motive of the crime if any of us could be sure that we know each other i ought to accept lady jane's estimate of her son thought lord cheriton but there is always the possibility of an unrevealed nature one phase in a character that has escaped discovery i am almost inclined to think the detective may have hit upon the truth there must have been a motive for this devilish act unless it were done by a maniac the latter supposition seemed hardly probable lunacy wandering loose about the country would have betrayed itself before now it was past five upon that summer afternoon and lord cheriton having seen his daughter and interviewed the detective was sauntering idly about the gardens in the blank hours before dinner that meal would be served as usual no doubt at eight o'clock with all due state and ceremony the cook and her maids were busied about its preparation even now in this tranquil hour when afternoon melts into evening sliding so softly from day to night that only those evening hymns of the birds and on sundays those melancholy church bells thrilling across the woods marked the transition they were scraping vegetables and whipping eggs while the birds were at vespers and they were talking of the murder as they went about their work when would they ever cease to gloat with ghoulish gusto on that deadly theme with endless iteration of says he and says she lord cheriton left the stately garden with its quadruple lines of cypress and juniper its marble balustrades and clipped yew hedges five feet thick its statues and alcoves he passed through a little gate and across a classic single arched bridge to the park where he sauntered slowly beneath his immemorial elms in a strange dreamlike frame of mind in which he allowed his senses to be beguiled by the balmy afternoon atmosphere and the golden light until the all-pervading consciousness of a great grief which had been with him all day slipped off him for the moment leaving only a feeling of luxurious repose rest after labour cheriton chase was exercising its wonted influence upon him he loved the place with that deep love which is often felt by the hereditary owner the man born on the soil but perhaps still oftener and to a greater degree by him who has conquered and won the land by his own hard labour of head or hand 
by that despicable personage the self-made man in all his wanderings those luxurious reposeful journeyings of the man who has conquered fortune james dalbrook's heart yearned towards these ancient avenues and yonder grey walls house and domain had all the charm of antiquity and yet they were in a measure his own creation everywhere had his hand improved and beautified and he might say with augustus that where he found brick he would leave marble the dense green walls those open-air courts and quadrangles those obelisks of cypress and juniper had been there in the dominion of the strangways with here and there a mouldering stone syrinx or a moss-grown pan but it was he who brought choicest marbles from rome and florence to adorn that stately pleasance it was he who had erected yonder fountain whose waters made a monotonous music by day and night the marble balustrades the mosaic floors the artistic enrichment of terrace and mansion had been his work if the farms were perfect it was he who had made them so if his tenants were contented it was because he had shown himself a model landlord considerate and liberal but severely exacting satisfied with nothing less than perfection having thus in a manner created his estate james dalbrook loved it as a proud self-contained man is apt to love the work of his own hands and now in this quiet sunday afternoon the very atmosphere of the place soothed him as if by a spell a kind of sensuous contentment stole into his heart with temporary forgetfulness of his daughter's ruined life but this did not last long as he drew near the drive by which strangers were allowed to cross the park by immemorial right he remembered that he had questioned one of the lodge-keepers but not the other he struck across an open glade where only old hawthorn trees cast their rugged shadows on the close-cropped turf and made for the gate opening into the land mrs porter's cottage had its usual aspect a cottage such as any gentleman or lady of refined taste might have been pleased to inhabit quaint medieval with heavy timbers across rough cast walls deep-set casements picturesque dormers and thatched roof with gable ends which were a source of rapture to every artist who visited cheriton a cottage embowered in loveliest creeping plants odorous of jasmine and woodbine and set in a garden where the standard roses and carnations were rumoured to excel those in her ladyship's own particular flower garden well might a lady who had known better days rejoice in such a haven more especially when those better days appeared to have raised her no higher than the status of a merchant captain's wife very few people about cheriton envied her ladyship it was considered that if not born in the purple she had at least brought her husband a large fortune and had a right to taste the sweets of wealth but there were many hard-driven wives and shabby genteel spinsters who envied mrs porter her sinecure at the gate of cheriton park and who looked grudgingly at the garden brimming with flowers and the lattices shining in the evening sun and through the open casements at prettily furnished rooms rich in books and photographs and other trivial indications of a refined taste it is well to be she said the curate's wife as she went home from the village with two mutton chops in her little fancy basket a basket which suggested ferns and in which she always carried a trowel to give a look of casual botany to her housewifely errands i wonder whether lord cheriton allows her an income for doing nothing or is it only house and coals and candles that she gets speculated the curate's wife who lived in a brand-new villa on the outskirts of cheriton village a villa that was shabby and dilapidated after three years occupation through whose thin walls all the winds of winter blew and whose slate roof made the upper floor like a bakehouse under the summer sun lord cheriton still sauntering in gloomy meditation came to the cottage garden outside his gates and found mrs porter standing among her roses a tall black figure the very pink and pattern of respectability with her prayer-book in one hand and a grey silk sunshade in the other she turned at the sound of those august footsteps and came to the little garden gate to greet her benefactor with a grave countenance as befitted the circumstances good afternoon he said briefly have you just come from church yes i have been to the children's service not very interesting i should imagine for anybody past childhood it is something to do on a sunday afternoon and i like to hear mr kempster talk to the children do you well there is no accounting for tastes can you tell me anything about my son-in-law's murderer have you seen any suspicious characters hanging about did you notice any one going into the park on friday night no i have not seen a mortal out of the common way the gate was locked at the usual hour of course the gate would make no difference it would be easy for any one to get into the park and no one was seen about it is extraordinary 
have you any idea mrs porter any theory about this horrible calamity that has come upon us how should i have any theory i am not skilled in finding out such mysteries like the man who came from london yesterday has he made no discoveries not one then you can't expect me to throw a light upon the subject you have an advantage over the london detective you know the neighbourhood and you know what kind of man sir godfrey was yes i know that how handsome he was how frank and pleasant looking and how your daughter adored him they were a beautiful couple her wan cheeks flushed and her eyes kindled as she spoke as if with a genuine enthusiasm they were and they adored each other it will break my daughter's heart you have known trouble about a daughter i think you can understand what i feel for my girl i do i do yes i know what you must feel what she must feel in her desolation with all she valued gone from her for ever but she has not to drink the cup that my girl must drink lord cheriton she has not fallen she is not a thing for men to trample under foot and women to shrink away from forgive me said lord cheriton in a softened voice i ought not to have spoken of mercy you ought never to speak of her to me i suppose you thought the wound was so old that it might be touched with impunity but you were wrong that wound will never heal i am sure you know that i have always been deeply sorry for you for that great affliction said lord cheriton gently sorry yes i suppose you were sorry you would have been sorry if a footman had knocked down one of your sevres vases and smashed it one is sorry for anything that can't be replaced that is a harsh and unjust way of speaking mrs porter said lord cheriton drawing himself up suddenly with an air of wounded dignity you can tell me nothing about our trouble i see and i'm not in the mood to talk of any older grief good night he lifted his hat with grave respect and walked back to the park gate vanishing slowly from those grey eyes which followed him in eager watchfulness is he really sorry she asked herself can such a man as that be sorry for any one even his own flesh and blood he has prospered all things have gone well with him can he be sorry it is a check perhaps a check to his ambitious hopes it balks him in his longing to found a family he looks pale and worn as if he had suffered and at his age after a prosperous life it must be hard to suffer so mused the woman who had seen better days embittered doubtless by her own decadence embittered still more by her daughter's fall it was nearly ten years since the daughter had eloped with a middle-aged colonel in a cavalry regiment a visitor at the chase a man of fortune and high family with about as diabolical a reputation as a man could enjoy and yet hold her majesty's commission mercy porter's fall had been a surprise to everybody she was a girl of shy and reserved manners graver and sadder than you should be she had been kept very close by her mother allowed to make no friendships among the girls in the village to have no companions of her own age she had early shown a considerable talent for music and her piano had been her chief pleasure and occupation lady cheriton had taken a good deal of notice of her when she grew up and she might have done well the gossips said when they recalled the story of her disgrace but she chose to fall in love with a married man of infamous character a notorious profligate and he had but to reckon with his finger for her to go off with him the circumstances of her going off were discussed confidentially at feminine tea-drinkings and it was wondered that mrs porter could hold her head so high and show herself at church three times on a sunday and entertain the curate and his wife to afternoon tea considering what had happened the curate and his wife were new arrivals comparatively and only knew that dismal common story from hearsay they were both impressed by mrs porter's regular attendance at the church services and by the excellence of that cup of tea with which she was always ready to entertain them whenever they cared to drop in at her cottage between four and five o'clock the inquest was opened early on the afternoon of monday at the humble little inn near the forge with its rustic sign live and let live juanita gave her evidence with a stony calmness which impressed those who heard her more than the stormiest outburst of grief could have done her mother and her husband's mother had both implored her not to break down to bear herself heroically through this terrible ordeal and they were both in the room to support her by their presence both were surprised at the firmness of her manner the clear tones of her voice as she made her statement telling how she had heard the shot in her dream and how she had gone down to the drawing-room to find sir godfrey lying face downward on the carpet in front of the chair where he had been sitting his hand still upon the open book which had fallen as he fell 
did you think of going outside to see if any one was lurking about no i thought of nothing but trying to save him i did not believe that he was dead there was a look of agony in her large wide-open eyes as she said this a piteous remembrance of the moment while she still hoped which thrilled the spectators what course did you take i rang for the servants they came after a time that seemed long but i believe they came quickly and after they had come i remembered nothing more they wanted me to believe that he was dead and i would not i could not believe and i remembered no more till next day that will do lady carmichael i will not trouble you further lady jane and lady cheriton wanted to take her away after this but she insisted upon remaining i wish to hear every word she said they submitted and the three women robed in densest black sat in a little group behind the coroner till the end of that day's inquiry no new facts were elicited from any of the witnesses and nothing had resulted from the elaborate search made not only throughout lord cheriton's domain but in the neighbourhood no suspicious prowlers had been heard of the gipsies who had contributed to the gaiety of the wedding-day had been ascertained to have left the isle of purbeck a fortnight before the murder and to be delighting the larger world between portsmouth and havant nothing had been discovered no sale of revolver or gun to any questionable purchaser at dorchester no indication however slight which might put a keen-witted detective upon the trail mr churton confessed himself completely at fault the jury drove to cheriton house to view the body and the inquest was adjourned for a fortnight in the expectation that some discovery might be made in the interim the funeral would take place at the usual time there was nothing now to hinder the victim being laid in his last resting-place in the old saxon church at millbrook bills offering a reward of five hundred pounds for any information leading to the discovery of the murderer were all over the village and in every village and town within a radius of forty miles the stimulus of cupidity was not wanting to sharpen the rural wit mr churton shook his head despondently when he talked over the inquest with lord cheriton later in the day and owned himself out of it i have been in many dark cases my lord he said and i've had many hard nuts to crack but this beats em all i can't see my way to making anything of it and unless you can furnish me with any particulars of the poor young gentleman's past life of an enlightening character i don't see much hope of getting ahead you stick to your idea of the murder being an act of revenge what other reason could there be for such a murder that question seemed unanswerable and lord cheriton let it pass matthew dalbrook and his elder son were to dine with him that evening in order to talk quietly and calmly over the terrible event of last week and the bearing which it must have upon his daughter's future life lady cheriton and lady jane carmichael had lived entirely on the upper floor taking such poor apologies for meals as they could be induced to take in her ladyship's morning-room that closed door at the eastern end of the corridor exercised its solemn influence upon the whole house those morning women never went in or out without looking that way and again and again through the long still days they visited that chamber of death carrying fairest blooms of stephanotis or camellia whitest rosebuds waxen lilies kneeling in silent prayer beside that white bed during all those dismal days before the funeral juanita lived secluded in her own room only leaving it to go to that silent room where the white bed and the white flowers made an atmosphere of cold purity which chilled her heart as if she too were dead she counted the hours which remained before even this melancholy link between life and death would be broken and when she must stretch out her hands blindly to find one whom the earth would hide from her for evermore in the brief snatches of troubled sleep that had visited her since friday night she had awakened with her husband's name upon her lips with outstretched hands that yearned for the touch of his awakening slowly to consciousness of the horrible reality in every dream that she had dreamed he had been with her and in some of those dreams had appeared with a distinctness which involved the memory of her sorrow yes she had thought him dead yes she had seen him stretched bleeding at her feet but that had been dream and delusion reality was here here in his strong voice here in the warm grasp of his hand here in the lying vision that was kinder than truth mr dalbrook and his son arrived at a quarter to eight and were received by lord cheriton in the library the drawing-room was now a locked chamber and it would be long doubtless before any one would have the courage to occupy that room 
the dalbrooks were to stay at cheriton till after the funeral matthew dalbrook had been sir godfrey's solicitor and it would be his duty to read the will he was also one of the trustees to juanita's marriage settlement and the time had come all too soon when the terms of that settlement would have to be discussed how is my cousin asked theodore when he had shaken hands with lord cheriton have you seen her since friday yes i saw her on saturday morning she was terribly changed a ghastly change is it not said lord cheriton with a sigh i doubt if there's any improvement since then but she behaved splendidly at the inquest this afternoon we were all prepared for her breaking down god knows whether she will ever get the better of her grief or whether she will go down to the grave a broken-hearted woman oh matt turning to his kinsman and contemporary such a trial as this teaches us how providence can laugh at our best laid plans i thought i had made my daughter's happiness as secure as the foundations of this old house you did your best james no man can do more theodore was silent for the most part after his inquiry about his cousin he listened while the elder men talked and gave his opinion when it was asked for and showed himself a clear-headed man of business but his depression was not the less evident the thought of juanita's grief the contrast between her agony now and her joyousness the day she was at dorchester was never absent from his mind and the talk of the two elder men the discussion as to the extent of her possessions her power to do this and that the house she was to live in the establishment she was to keep jarred upon him horribly by the conditions of the settlement the priory is to be hers for life with everything it contains by the conditions of sir godfrey's will in the event of his leaving no issue the priory estate is to go after his widow's death to mrs grenville's eldest son or failing a son in that direction then to mrs morningside's eldest son should neither sister leave a son surviving at the time of lady carmichael's death the estate is to be sold and the product divided with equal portions among the surviving nieces but at the present rate at which the two ladies are filling their nurseries there is very little doubt there will be a surviving son mrs grenville was sir godfrey's favourite i know and i can understand his giving her boy the estate and thus founding a family rather than dividing the property between the issue of the two sisters i do not think anybody can find fault with his will said lord cheriton god knows that when i saw him sign it in my room in victoria street an hour after his marriage nothing was further from my thoughts than the idea that the will would come into force within the next fifty years it seemed almost an idle precaution for so young a man to be in such a hurry to set his house in order do you think juanita will decide to live at the priory asked mr dalbrook it would seem more natural for her to live here with her mother and me but i fear that this house will seem for ever a curse to her she will remember that it was her own whim to spend her honeymoon here it will seem to her as if she had brought her husband to his death oh god when i remember how her mother and i suggested other places how we talked to her of the tyrol and the dolomites of hungary norway and with what a kind of childish infatuation she clung to her fancy for this house it seems as if a hideous fatality guided her to her doom it is her doom as well as his i do not believe she will ever be a happy woman again it may seem so now to us all to herself most of all poor girl answered matthew dalbrook but i never saw a sorrow yet that time could not heal and the sorrow of a girl of nineteen leaves such a wide margin for time's healing powers god grant that you and i may both live to see her bright and happy again with a second husband there is something prosaic i feel in the very sound but there may be some touch of romance even in a second love he did not see the painful change in his son's face while he was talking the sudden crimson which faded slowly to a ghastly pallor it had never occurred to matthew dalbrook that his son theodore had felt anything more than a cousinly regard for lord cheriton's daughter the funeral took place on the following wednesday one of those funerals about which people talk for a month and in which grief is almost lost sight of by the majority of the mourners in a feverish excitement the procession of carriages very few of them unoccupied was nearly half a mile long the little churchyard at millbrook could scarcely contain the mourners the sisters husbands were there with hats hidden in crape and solemn countenances honestly sorry for their brother-in-law's death but not uninterested in his will 
all the district within a radius of thirty miles had been on the alert to pay this last mark of respect to a young man who had been universally liked and whose melancholy fate had moved every heart the will was read in the library and juanita appeared for the first time since her cousins had been at cheriton she came into the room with her mother and went to matthew and his son quietly and gave a hand to each and answered their grave inquiries about her health without one tear or one faltering accent and then she took her seat beside her father's chair and waited for the reading of the will it seemed to her as if it contained her husband's last words addressed to her from his grave he knew when he wrote or dictated those words that she would not hear them in his lifetime the will left her a life interest in everything except twenty thousand pounds in consuls to lady jane a few legacies to old servants and local charities and a few souvenirs to college friends sir godfrey had held the estate in fee simple and could deal with it as he pleased he expressed a hope that if his wife survived him she should continue to live at the priory and that the household should remain as far as possible unchanged that no old horse should ever be sold and no dogs disposed of in any way off the premises this last request was to secure a continuance of old customs his father had never allowed a horse that he had kept over a twelve month to be sold and had never parted with a dog his own hand shot the horse that was no longer fit for service his own hand poisoned the dog whose life had ceased to be a blessing when the will was finished and it was by no means a lengthy document lady jane kissed her daughter-in-law he will do as he wished won't you dearest she said softly live at the priory yes lady jane unless you will live there instead it would be more natural for you to be mistress there when when my darling made that will he must have thought of me as an old woman likely to survive him by a few years at most and it would seem natural to him for me to go on living in his house to continue to live those were his words you know to continue to live in the home of my married life but all is different now and it would be better for you to have the priory it has been your home so long it is full of associations and interest for you i can live anywhere anywhere except in this detested house she had spoken in a low voice all the time so low as to be quite inaudible to her father and matthew dalbrook who were talking confidentially upon the other side of the wide oak table my love it is your house it will be full of associations for you too the memories of his youth it may comfort you by and by to live among the things he cared for and i can be with you there now and then you will bear with a melancholy old woman now and then pleaded lady jane with tearful tenderness the only answer was a sob and a clinging pressure of the hand and then the three women quietly left the room their interest in the business was over blinds had been drawn up and venetian shutters opened there was a flood of sunshine on the staircase and in the corridors as juanita went back to her room the perfume of the roses and the breath of summer came in at the open windows oh god how the sun shines she cried in a sudden agony of remembrance those odours from the garden the blue sky summer greenery and dazzling summer light brought back the image of her vanished happiness last week less than a week ago she had been one of the joyous creatures in that glad gay world joyous as a thrush whose song was thrilling upon the soft sweet air lady jane's two sons-in-law had drawn near the oak table at which the lawyer was seated with his papers before him jessica's husband mr grenville was sporting his thoughts were centred in his stable where he found an all-sufficient occupation for his intellectual powers in an endless buying exchanging selling summering and wintering his stud in the invention of improved bits and the development of new ideas in saddlery in the performance of operations that belong rather to the professional veterinary than to the gentleman at large and in the conversation of his stud groom these resources filled up all the margin that was left for a man who hunted four days a week in his own district and who often got a fifth and even a sixth day in other countries accessible by rail it may have been a natural result of mr grenville's devotion to the stable that mrs grenville was absorbed by her nursery but it may have been a natural bent on the lady's part however this might be the lady and the gentleman followed parallel lines in which their interests never clashed he talked of hardly anything but his horses she rarely mentioned any other subject than her children or something bearing upon her children's well-being he believed his horses to be the best in the country she considered her babies unsurpassed in creation 
both in their line were supremely happy mr morningside married to sir godfrey's younger sister ruth was distinctly parliamentary and had no sympathies in common with such men as hugo grenville to him horses were animals with four legs who dragged burdens who were expensive to keep and whose legs were liable to fill or to develop superfluous bone on the slightest provocation his only idea of a saddle-horse was a slow and stolid cob for whose virtuous disposition and powerful bone he had paid nearly three hundred pounds and on which he pounded round the park three or four times every morning during the parliamentary season an exercise of which he was about as fond as he was of pulna water but which had been recommended him for the good of his liver mr morningside had a castle in the north too near newcastle to be altogether beautiful and he had a small suite upon a fifth floor in queen anne's mansion he had taken this apartment as a bachelor pied-à-terre for the parliamentary season and he had laid considerable emphasis upon the landowner's necessity for stern economy which had constrained him to take rooms so small as to be altogether impossible for his wife mrs morningside was however of a different opinion no place was impossible for her which her dear steward deigned to occupy she did not mind small rooms or a fifth story was there not a lift and were there not charming people living ever so much nearer the skies she did not mind even what she gracefully described as pigging it for her dear steward's sake she was utterly unlike her elder sister and she had no compunction at placing over two hundred miles between her and her nursery they'd wire me if anything went wrong she said and the express would take me home in a few hours that would depend upon what time you got the wire the express doesn't go every quarter of an hour like a royal blue replied mr morningside gloomily he was a dry-as-dust man one of those self-satisfied persons who are never less alone than when alone he had married at five-and-thirty and the comfortable habits of a priggish bachelor still clove to him after six years of married bliss he was fond of his wife in her place and he thought her a very charming woman at the head of his table and receiving his guests at morningside castle but it was essential to his peace that he should have many solitary hours in which to pore over blue books and meditate upon an intended speech he fancied himself greatly as a speaker and he was one of those parliamentary bores whose ornate periods are made mincemeat of by the reporters he looked to a day when he would take his place with burke and walpole and other giants whose oratory had been received coldly in the dawn of their senatorial career he gave himself up to much study of politics past and present and was one of those well-informed bores who are only useful as a storehouse of hard facts for the use of livelier speakers when a man had to speak upon a subject of which he knew nothing he went to mr morningside as to a parliamentary encyclopedia to sustain these stores of knowledge mr morningside required much leisure for what is called heavy reading and heavy reading is not easy in that genial family life which means incessant talk and incessant interruption mr morningside would have preferred therefore to keep his den on the fifth floor to himself but his wife loved london and he could not refuse her the privilege of occasionally sharing his nest on a level with the spires and towers of the great city she made her presence agreeably felt by tables covered with photograph easels valorous vases stray flowers and specimen glasses which were continually being knocked over japanese screens and every known variety of chairback and albeit he was an essentially dutiful husband mr morningside never felt happier than when he had seen his ruth comfortably seated in the bournemouth express on her way to the home of her forefathers for one of those protracted visits that no one but a near relation would venture to make he left her cheerily on such occasions with a promise to run down to the priory on saturday evenings whenever it was possible to leave the helm mr morningside had liked his brother-in-law as well as it was in him to like any man and had been horrified at that sudden inexplicable doom but sir godfrey being snatched off this earth in the flower of his age mr morningside thought it only natural that the young morningsides should derive some benefit immediate or contingent from their uncle's estate it was therefore with some disgust that he heard that clause in the will which gave jessica's sons the preference over all the sons of ruth true that failing any son of jessica's the estate was to lapse to the eldest surviving son of ruth but what earthly value was such a reversionary interest as this in the case of a lady whose nursery was like a rabbit warren i congratulate you on your eldest boy's prospects grenville said mr morningside sourly your tom a boy whom he hated will come into a very fine thing one of these days humph muttered grenville 
lady carmichael's is a good life and i should be very sorry to see it shortened besides who can tell before this time next year there may be a nearer claimant lord have mercy upon us exclaimed morningside i never thought of that contingency End of chapter eight